Today we're gonna to talk about blood pressure. When you take a blood pressure, you're gonna to have to use a cuff. And the most important thing when you get first get started is using the right size cuff. Now, all of them are going to have some sort of index. In this particular case, it says index line, that white line there, and then there's lines there. So when you line, put this around the patient's arm, this white line needs to be inside those. If it's outside, it's too, the patient's arm is too big. If it's inside, the patient's arm is too small. The reason this is important is by using the wrong size cuff, you're gonna get an incorrect reading. So make sure you're using the right size cuff. So on here, you've kind of got a little guide. We've got a medium adult right here. Here we have a large adult, and there's even a larger one for using legs. And then we also have child ones, and we even have baby ones. So the most important thing is, if you use a cuff that's too big, your blood pressure reading is gonna be low. If you use a cuff that's too small, it's gonna be high. When it comes to taking the blood pressure, the first thing is to make sure that you've got the right size cuff. We just talked about that. The next thing is patient should be seated, back should be supported, feet should be on the ground, legs uncrossed, and arms should be supported at about heart level. If you don't have these things in place, then you're gonna have an incorrect reading. Next, we want that patient to be relaxed and calm resting for at least five minutes in a stimulus-free room. Now, technically, she's not supposed to talk to me, I'm not supposed to talk to her, and we're supposed to be here sitting here for five minutes. Yeah, that never actually happens, but that's how it's supposed to work. Then the next thing we wanna do is ask the patient, have you had any caffeine or any nicotine products in the last 30 minutes? No. Because that can also cause an increased blood pressure reading. So we're gonna place the cuff on the patient's arm. There should be an artery line, and the artery line you want to be about midline or slightly medial to midline. And then what we're going to do is, with this, righty-tighty, lefty-loosey. You want to make sure that it's slightly tight, and I mean slightly, because what happens once you pump this up is it's going to be under pressure and it's not going to be as easy to loosen. So especially if you don't have very strong fingers, it's like, and it goes too quickly downwards. So ever so slightly tight, find the patient's radial pulse, pump it up until the radial pulse can't be felt anymore, and then let it out until you feel it again. All right, now that number where you start, started feeling it again, that number is their palpated pressure and it represents the systolic pressure. So what we're gonna do is that number in her case was 110. We're going to pump it up to 130 for when we actually take the blood pressure reading. All right, now that we've done the palpated pressure, we're ready to go ahead and do the auscultated pressure. So we're gonna put your stethoscope in. And you can use either the diaphragm or the belt if your stethoscope has one. So one of the things you wanna make sure is that you get a good seal on the patient's arm. So a lot of times patients will have the edge of it up like that and they wonder why they can't hear anything. So make sure there's a really good seal, just ever so slightly tight, make sure you can see the dial well, and pump it up 30 millimeters higher than we just palpated. So in this case, that will be 140. Let it out at about two millimeters per second. and you're listening for the very first sound, it'll sound kind of like a pulse, like bump, bump, bump. So the first time you hear a sound, the first bump, that is the systolic pressure. And when you hear the sound go away, the last sound you hear, that's the diastolic pressure. And those are called Karatkov sounds, named after Dr. Karatkov, who discovered them. And in her case, the blood pressure was 116 over 68. Now we're gonna talk about pulse oximetry. So pulse oximetry measures the percentage of hemoglobin that is saturated with oxygen. So it's sometimes known as O2 sat. Um, it's abbreviated SPO2 for pulse oximetry, which is different than SAO2, which is when you do an arterial blood gas and you actually withdraw blood from the patient. Um, SAO2 numbers will always be a little bit lower than SPO2 numbers because as soon as you take the blood out of the patient, oxygen is beginning to escape into the atmosphere. Um, so the pulse ox device, they have these little portable ones and they also have very large ones. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna turn it on and then you're going to place it on the patient's fingernail. And you're gonna wait for it to beep. And it will tell you their SPO2 and their heart rate. 
Is it broken or are you dead? All right. Now, at the moment, it's saying her heart rate is 48 and her SpO2 is 91. So we're going to call a code here. <laughs> Rapid response team. Unless she's really athletic. Yeah. OK, so now it's coming up to 61. SpO2 is still 90. That's probably because it's cold in here, which is causing vasoconstriction of her finger, which is impairing our reading. Um, some other things that can impair reading include thick nails or ac acrylic nails. Um, if a patient has acrylic nails on, then you can pop them off if you need to um, or defer the test if it's not needed. Um, sometimes pulse oximetry is done routinely rather than when it's actually needed to be done. Um, Another thing that, that you want to consider is fingernail polish. If the patient has fingernail polish on, you can still do it. Most of the time it'll work. If it doesn't, then you can either use a different finger or use nail polish remover. In this video, we're going to show you how to do a oral thermometer with one of these um, Welch Allen Shore Temp thermometers. Now, these might look similar, but they are not similar. This one is red. This one is blue. Blue goes in the mouth. Red goes in the rectum. Now, if you ever come at a patient with one of these red ones to put it in their mouth, you are not going to be a nurse. Do you understand me? I'm not joking. Um, every year we hear horror stories of a student who tries to put this in a patient's mouth. Now, if they're lucky, the student realizes what's going on beforehand, and if they're not lucky, than one of their classmates does. And if they're really not lucky, they actually do the patient. Don't do it. Right. Kids. Me. All right. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna lift this out and you're going to place one of these uh, temperature probe covers on it. An extremely important thing is you wanna keep the probe vertical in the box. Don't let it go diagonal because sometimes the probe will get lost in there and you can't quite push it on. You look like an idiot, don't do that. So another thing that can be a problem is if you're pushing down like this, it's not working. You have to hold it from the side so that that little button can be pushed out. Um, now we're going to, have to place it under the patient's tongue to the side. And you might need to hold it, or sometimes you can ask the patient to hold it. Um, patients should close their lips around the probe, but not bite down. If you don't have a patient who can follow these directions, then you can't use an oral thermometer for them. All right. So in this case, we got a reading, and then you push the button to eject it. It'll sometimes fly. So in this case, we're going to hold it, and we do it, hold it from the end. If your patient can't do oral thermometer because of some reason, and you're not going to do a rectal temperature on them, then you can use an axillary. And in this case, there is a little setting in here where you can set for the thermometer to understand that it's an axillary reading. And when you go to document your temperature, you need to document the route that you use to take the temperature. And one last thing is that you want to make sure your patient hasn't had anything to eat or drink within the last 30 minutes because that can raise the patient or lower the patient's temperature reading hot or cold liquids. All right, we're going to learn how to do a palpated pulse or heart rate at this time. Most of the time you're going to be assessing the radial pulse, which is on the radial side, thumb side. Um, pinky side is ulnar. You can also palpate an ulnar pulse, but it's usually weaker and we usually don't do it. So you're going to place three to uh, two to three fingers on the radial fossa. So there's two tendons that run, run right through here, and then there's a bone right there, and there's a little space in between, and that's where you're going to palpate. Now, on some patients, you're going to feel it a little, a little bit lower. Some patients, you're going to feel it a little bit higher. Um, sometimes you might have to have the patient bend the wrist backwards so that you can expose the artery a little bit more. So you have to play with it, the, the area, and you're also going to have to use sometimes um, deeper palpation or lighter palpation in order to palpate the pulse. Now, you can also approach from the outside of the wrist or from the inside. So in her case, I'm actually feeling it much stronger from here than I was feeling it from this direction. So that's another thing you might need to experiment with on different patients. Um, usually I go from the outside, but sometimes going from the inside works better. Once you find the pulse, you're going to use your uh, imaginary watch and you're going to count the number of beats in 30 seconds and then multiply by two. Now, some of the older guides will say to count for 15 seconds and multiply by four, but the newer guidelines say that there's too much error when you do that, so they recommend 30 seconds. Now, if the patient's pulse is regular, so boom, 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 
then you can do that. If it's irregular, so it's like boom, 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 then you're going to have to feel or palpate for an entire minute, and then you don't multiply. Remember that normal values are between 60 and 100 for adults. Anything lower than 100, or sorry, anything lower than 60 is bradycardia. Anything above 100 is tachycardia. Now, kids and babies are going to have higher numbers than that, and um, babies can run up to 150 would be considered normal. So make sure we're talking about adults here. Okay, next we're going to talk about respirations. So the number of times a patient breathes in and breathes out. So we're going to have to look at their chest without letting them know we're doing that. Why don't you breathe normally? The moment you tell someone to breathe normally or let them know you're looking at their breathing, their breathing will change. So our technique is going to be to palpate the patient's wrist, 30 seconds palpating their heart rate, and then you're just going to shift your eyes toward the chest and you're going to watch them breathe. Now, from the patient's perspective, you've just palpated their wrist for one minute. But of that one minute, one a minute, 30 seconds of it was, was spent counting heart rate. The other 30 seconds was spent counting respirations. Multiply by, one, by two, and you get the patient's respirations for the minute. So in her case, I counted eight. So multiply that by two, that would be 16. Normal breathing rate is going to be 12 to 20. Anything less than 12 is considered bradypnea, or sometimes some people say bradypenia. Don't ask me who's right. Anything above 20 is considered tachypnea, and some people say tachypnea. <laughs> this has got harassment written all of it. Just saying. Just saying. <laughs> okay, cut me off. <laughs> and you said a lot of times the patients will ha will have this yeah. instead of the. Patients nurse. will have what? You said a lot of times the patient will have. Oh, it whoops! Instead of the nurse or the. Student. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, these things happen. <laughs> Is there a little fast flashing red light that lets you know you're recording? No. Is that being recorded? Yes. Get ready. <laughs> it works. <laughs> Get set. Go. Yeah. So in her case, her blood pressure was about 116 over 68. Don't ever say that. And you've got a little child and even little babies. Aren't they so cute? Oh, sorry. So anyway, back to that important point. <laughs> Couldn't help it. <laughs> <clears throat> so here we have a medium adult. <laughs> we have a faulty device here. Because you're above that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> All right, we're 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 live here, people. <laughs> Fozzie Bear. Ah. It doesn't make sense without the context. We have to just spend context. one afternoon and just go through all these um, <laughs> bloopers and just like sit there and have donuts and watch the bloopers. It would be so much fun. All right. Okay. So next we next got paralyzed from it throughout her body. <laughs> yes, so. yes, that's because he was not qualified to do exactly. it. Exactly. And he injected like it was like twenty times the and normal it was, dose. It was imported from some other country. At least it's better than it the guy. It was very cheap that... Botox. Don't use cheap Botox. At least it's better than the guy that injected Fixaflat as uh, <laughs> augmentation for the buttocks. Uh, very nice. Very nice. Things not to do in the medical profession. This is why you need a licensed doctor. <laughs> I still won't get Botox. I'm afraid. I will do Juvederm. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> why am I? I'm telling the world I'm going to do Juvederm. Okay. That's going in. <laughs> okay. I can see him doing that though, right? Can you see? I can see him do that. Just saying. Again, don't tell me who's right because I ain't care. Again, you say potato, I say potato. You say tomato, I say tomato. Bradypnea? <laughs> Some people do. Come on. Some people do. Tachypnea. 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 Shut up, you tachypnea. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, uh, <laughs> yeah. 
Anyway, <clears throat> moving along it's now. Funny, like doing the the skin vocabulary, I was going, and they're like, "That's how you say it. That's how you say yeah. it." For almost every word. Did I miss anything? <laughs> are we are we just talking? <laughs> I think so. Maybe. All right. You clear. Clear. Blood pressure, temperature.